So the first module of this school is uh, on neutronics. And uh, as you know, is, um, is a three hour module the, base, the basic lecture will be given by me and I have to acknowledge also the fact that the second lecture, so the advanced lecture, will be given by my colleague from PSI, Girgi Krepel, that just disappeared from the, <laughs> from, the, from the webcam and you are going to see him for a full hour after the break. So let's go into the business then. I, okay. As I said, my, the objective of my lecture is basic, and so I'm talking about basics of MSR, and I would specify MSFR, Neutronics. I was trying to find a way to start the discussion because there are many ways in which you can perform this discussion. And I found, I was looking for the definition of Neutronics, actually, because many times we use words without being sure that all the other people are aware of the, significance, of the meaning of these words. So I found that among many other possible references, I found in a monography by, uh, that was edited in CA, a definition of neutronics as the study of neutron paths through matter of condition for a chain reaction and alteration in matter's composition induced by nuclear reaction. It makes it possible to design and operate nuclear reactors. I found this, uh, this definition rather uh, useful for my objective today because uh, it's actually providing us step by step the information that we need to understand the neutronics of molten salt reactors. So I'm just, okay. So the key aspect, let's start from the beginning. We're talking about neutron path and interaction with matter. This is a point that is important to remember. Remember that this is a basic lecture. So sometimes I might be saying things that for many people are uh, obvious. They have seen it many times. For some others might not be as obvious. So my objective is really to provide a common background for everyone. So neutron path, the neutron path is the traveling of a neutron between one collision and the other. And since neutrons are neutral, they travel in straight lines. So it's the, the path that they travel in void in between atoms before uh, reaching the position where they actually interact with the nucleus of an atom. And then there are the interaction with matter. Here I was borrowing uh, pictures from a manual of an MC code actually. And I found it very nice because at the first level, you can just say, okay, what can happen to a neutron? It can collide, have an interaction, a scattering interaction so that there is an exchange of energy and the neutron changes its direction together with changing its energy. Or it can have an interaction with the nucleus such that it gets absorbed. So it disappears into the nucleus and that's the end of it. That's the end of the life of the neutron. Of course, if you take a step forward that is more interesting for us as nuclear engineers, there is also another option, a collision that uh, re results in emissions, emissions of more than one neutron. And this is what is described here graphically on the right, where starting from one neutron, you have the generation of two paths at a certain point or even more. What is this phenomenon? Well, it's the fission phenomenon. The fact that when you have a fission event together with the generation of energy, you also have the generation of more than one neutron. This is again another graphical picture that is giving you the feeling of it, even though it's of course not very technical, but you see everything actually. You see the fissile material, you see the neutron, you see the generation of uh, these uh, fragments, otherwise called fission products, and the generation of new neutrons. There are more than one, and this is good because this allows us to have the propagation of a chain reaction. Other neutrons produced can induce other fission or do something else, like leaking, running away from our reactor like this one, this guy on the right. Since I'm talking about fission neutrons, I do a little reminder that is a kind of a jump forward, but I'm going to get back to that as well. Fission neutrons are emitted in two different ways. A, the, the large majority are emitted as prompt. That means that are emitted straight away together with the fission phenomenon. Then there is a small fraction that is small really because it's below 1%, but it has a huge role in, uh, uh, in, the, in the behavior of a nuclear reactor that are emitted a certain time after because they are associated to the decay of a fission, of some fission products. And these are called delayed. And 
all of them, prompt and delayed, have an energy distribution. They're not coming out at all at the same energy. This is distribution is called the spectrum. And if you look at this graph, you just remember the, let's say, the, the main characteristics that we may say that, well, it doesn't seem to change that much, this spectrum moving from one fissile material to the other. But more importantly, the delayed neutron are less energetic. They have an average energy that is lower, it's below one MeV, while the average energy for prom neutron is two MeV. This is something that I will use afterwards, so I wanted just to introduce it already here. Now let's move on. We got to the condition for chain reaction and all of this is useful to design and operate nuclear reactors. So what we are discussing today is one of the ingredients of the big, uh, <laughs> let's say the big pot in which you have to combine different expertise in order to design and operate a nuclear reactor. So I wanted to make a general statement about that because it's very important that we realize how uh, this is really just one of the ingredients because the actual behavior of a nuclear reactor is the result of the interaction of various physical phenomena. So even if I'm looking at these words I used before, like the, the, the fact that you have interaction with matter and the free path, the interaction and fission, you already imply many other physical phenomena coming in. If you're thinking about the power production through fission, this means that you have to take care of the, of the fluid thermal fluid dynamics of the coolant that you use in order to transfer such power. And of course, also the thermomechanical effect on the solid components that are constituting your system. If you're thinking about what I call the element transmutation, the fact that the interaction with neutron induces a modification of the medium in which the neutrons are moving, well, the typical uh, topic that comes to my mind is the fuel cycle analysis. So how the fuel in the reactor evolves. And this, for instance, is something that is going to be treated in detail by my colleague, Girgi. Then there are other phenomena related to the change of the material, like the neutron activation, the fact that also the components inside the, the nuclear island gets activated by the interaction with neutrons. So there are other issues related to radiation protection, for instance. All of this together, are part of the safety assessment that you need to perform in order to prove that the design of the reactor that you want to, cons cons uh, to, to build is safe. And these are all topics and these and others will be topics for the, next, for the next lecture for sure and for the next module. So we are just starting a journey that is very much interconnected one module to the other, I may say. So my role here, as I said, basic lecture, I basically will want to convey two, two concepts, two ideas, two topics that I want to cover in these lectures. First, the peculiarities of molten salt reactors, I'm also calling them every once in a while liquid fuel because what I'm worried, well, what I'm worried, what I'm interested in, the peculiarity I'm looking at is the fact that the fuel is liquid, it's not solid and it is moving. So the peculiarities of a molten salt reactor with respect to other nuclear reactor design due to the fuel in liquid form. This is the first topic. Just to understand what is the, the fundamental difference, if you start from a standard, this is, I'm not saying that it's coming from a specific design. In fact, you see this picture is coming from a website. Uh, it's uh, in a fuel, in a, in a reactor, you have the fuel pellet, you have the cladding, it is surrounded by the coolant, then all together the fuel pellets, so the fuel pin constitute the fuel assembly and many fuel assemblies constitute the core. Then you go to the molten salt reactor and, and I'm really talking about the molten salt reactor we are going to discuss today. There is no fuel pellet, there is no fuel fabrication of a fuel pellet surrounded by a cladding. You don't have a coolant. Why? Because the fissile fuel is acting as fuel and coolant at the same time. So you have a liquid in which you have internal heat generation. And I'm going to make a small comment on that afterwards. Therefore, there is no fuel pin, there is no fuel assembly. There is a fuel core that is filled with this fissile salt specifically. If you notice, this is a drawing, a elabor graphical elaboration I made myself on the previous picture. And if you notice, I introduced no control elements, pipes. It's really looking like everything is homogeneous. 
okay? And of course, there is a reason for that, because this is a peculiarity of the MSFR, so the fast neutron spectrum molten salt reactor. This is a peculiarity, an aspect that uh, um, characterizes the MSFR with respect to the, let's say, the initial design of molten salt reactor, the design that dates back to the 60s. In some sense, also the design that inspired the graphical support that was provided by the Gen 4 uh, when describing, uh, by the GIF for the description of the Gen 4 reactor concept. This picture here, I, see, I think you have seen it many times, is the drawing of the molten salt reactor you see in the website of the Gen 4 reactors. And it is drawn with the presence of pipes through which the fissile fuel is flowing, surrounded by some material that, in the case of the uh, Oak Ridge MSRE, was actually graphite. So now we are talking about something different in terms of design, because there is no moderator, there is no graphite, neither other material acting as a moderator. What is a moderator? A material that allows you to reduce the average energy of neutrons when they are emitted by fission. They are MEV, they can be reduced in energy by the presence of a specific kind of materials that are the moderators like graphite or water in PWR. And therefore the core is homogeneous. So it's a really different design that requires uh, different approaches in its analysis. So I'm starting from with the equation. I, I am working in this field, I am teaching this kind of stuff in my university, so this is my approach. I need to have equations to support my, my discussions, uh, so you have to cope with that. So we're talking about neutronics, so what are the neutrons doing inside this reactor? And a way to describe this is through equations that are the mathematical support of our, of our physical understanding. So the neutronics equation are balance equation. You're basically just looking at where are neutrons in space, R, at which energy they are, E, and in which direction they're moving, omega, at any instant in time in principle. Then you write down this balance equation that of course uh, uh, pays credit to, Bolt's, to the Boltzmann equation for gases uh, uh, once it, uh, it has been modified in order to be linear for the characteristics of neutron propagating in, in a medium, but that's another story. And you have all the different physical phenomena represented in a mathematical form. So the fact that the neutrons move around, they get absorbed, they scatter, they make fission and they are emitted straight away, prompt fission emission, or they make fission and the fission neutrons are emitted at a later stage. And therefore you need also to introduce something else. You have to introduce another information regarding the, what are called, I don't remember if I have it here, no. Uh, so I will do, say it afterwards, I'm sorry about that. So as I said, the fission neutrons, the number of fission neutrons, the letter that is typically used is nu, larger than one, are emitted at, this, at each fission, we know that. A certain part is emitted, as we said, with the fission event. And what is, how do we measure this? What is the symbol and the quantity that characterize this prompt neutron? It's one minus beta. Why? Because beta is the delayed neutron fraction. So it's the fraction of fission neutrons emitted with the delay. And therefore, we need to study when they are emitted. Since they are emitted by the decay of some fission products, we need to study where these fission products are. So we need to study the evolution of the delay neutron precursor concentration. So how many neutron precursors per unit volume per, um, we have inside our system, inside the reactor. And this is the motivation of this last term. So in fact, if you see lambda C is the classic term that you find when you are solving a radioactive decay problem. So it's a, you are really seeing the physical phenomenon coming out here. So these are the two, the two parts that are explicitly coming out in, a, in a, a, um, let's say, appearing in an equation. But this also implies that you need to have an equation for the delay neutron precursors. So you write down the equation for the delay neutron precursors. Again, it's a balance equation. And you find the physical phenomena represented in the mathematical form. So you have the evolution in time of the delay neutron precursors concentration. That is due to the fact that they disappear because they decay. And this is, as I said, the classic term lambda C, classic de radioactive decay term. But they are also produced because every time there is fission, there is the production of 
fission products and part of them are actually the precursors that we are looking for. Then, in principle, you have, you have closed the problem, mathematically speaking, you have the equation for the neutronics of a fission reactor. But now we are talking about molten salt reactors, so we have to take into account the role of, of the fact that the fuel is moving. So let's to go back to physics. What happens if the fissile fuel is moving? Well, the neutrons by themselves are basically unaffected because the free flight, as I was saying previously, is in between atoms. So when the, the neutron is traveling, is not uh, dragged by some kind of force, it's traveling in vacuum, then at a certain point it interacts with the nucle nucleus of an atom and you have the collision. Therefore, for what regards the equation for the neutrons, nothing changes. But conversely, the delayed neutron precursors are atoms that they go together with all the other atoms of the fluid around them. So basically they are dragged, if you, if you allow me to use this expression, they are dragged by the salt. Physical effect, the delayed emission, so the, the neutrons that they are then emitting afterwards, after a certain amount of time, might happen in a different location with respect to the propped emission. This is the physics. What about the mathematically? the mathematics, you need to add an advection term. This drag that I wrote above becomes an operator, becomes a differential operator in space that is telling you that you, there is something, another physical phenomenon happening. I add that because it's close to my heart, a classic reference for that, because even in the 60s, I mean, it's not really something that was discovered very recently. And it's important that you that we all keep the, the give the correct credit to the, to, the, to the classics. Of course, there has been a lot of work in this field, so this is a classic reference that there are tons of references. For instance, I also mentioned one paper out of the many. On top of the advection term, considering the fact that you may also have diffusion, so uh, in, the, in this fluid, you may also have the presence of a diffusion term. It's uh, something that I don't want to discuss here because I believe that the peculiarity of molten salt reactor is very well represented by this specific term, okay? And, uh, well, what happens then due to the fact that you have this advection term? Let's look at it macroscopically. The fuel velocity is in the range of meter per second. The precursor lifetime, so the lifetime, one of the mean lifetime, that is the inverse of the decay constant, so one over lambda, if you look at the values of lambda, you will see that the mean lifetime is in the range of one to several mm, tenths of seconds. So the, the displacement could be very big. I was trying to draw something. You see, this is the fission event. Well, the delayed emission may be really somewhere else inside the core. Or even worse, it could be somewhere else because it's going so far that the delayed emission is, for instance, inside the circuit or even in the heat exchanger where you have the exchange of energy, the, 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 the transfer, the heat transfer to the secondary fluid. In fact, you're going to see it when you're going to discuss design of molten salt reactors, typically an intermediate circuit is, is considered. Why? Because all the fluid that is going through the primary circuit is highly radioactive, is fissile material. Therefore, it's better to have an intermediate circuit not going directly to the secondary side, let's say, of the thermal uh, cycle. So this is a, a, a macroscopic effect that we can imagine just picturing in our head. Then you go into the modeling and you realize that this is a str strong multiphysics. Because if you, even if you want to solve these equations, you need to have the information on the velocity field. And how do you calculate that with the thermal hydraulic analysis? That of course you can calculate if you have the power that is provided by the fission. So the linking, the, the, the coupling among these physics is even stronger than in other reactor design. I wanted just to give you some colorful picture because sometimes it's also nice. I'm not doing this kind of uh, colorful pictures typically. These are a few results. The one on the top are the results for the MSFR actually regarding the fuel salt velocity and the fuel salt temperature. And you see on top of the fact that you can see the numbers. So it's also interesting to have an idea on the numbers. So meter per second, you see two is a reasonable value. You also see how the solution of the problem implies the necessity to do a multiphysics simulation involving velocity, temperature, the concentration of precursors, and you see how strange they look. 
depending on what? Depending on the decay time. So how long it takes for them to decay, because if they take a long time to decay, they have the time to travel in many places. All of this is the multiphysics you are going to see in module three in October. So stay tuned because you're going to see a lot more of that. Myself, basic stuff. So I'm just telling you, this is the exercise that I'm going to show you how to solve uh, in the last session of this module. You can solve the problem, the neutronic problem in the simplest way ever. Uh, of course, making assumption, it's typical. So if you take a model that is simple, diffusion one group, that means no energy dependence, solve it in steady state so that we can look at the criticality problem. Simple geometry, let's take a slab and let's take it homogeneous. So all the character, all the material properties are the same everywhere. You take only one family of precursors just to make it simple. You can, you can, of course, you know that new delayed neutrons are not emitted all by the same kind of fission product. So there are different families with different decay constant. We just take one. Velocity field, we consider it known. So it's the simplest formulation of the problem. So simple that you can even solve it basically analytically. I'm going to comment to, to show you how you can do that so that you can try to solve it yourself, uh, not during the lecture because it would take a little bit longer, but at least uh, you have the grasps on how to do it yourself to be independent in solving this problem. Let's try to show at least a spoiler of the kind of results we are going to see in the exercise because I want to to show you some physical effects. So we said the precursors are redistributed in the core and may even emit neutrons outside the core. So as if they are outside the core, they are useless. So I didn't say that previously, so I'm already showing you the result. I should have said it previously. If some neutrons are going outside of the core and they are emitted somewhere else, not in the core, they are useless and therefore they do not contribute to the prosecution of the fission chain. They are useless result is your system is less reactive. So you have a change in the multiplication eigenvalue of the problem, what is called K effective. In principle, let's, let, let me say that in very simple terms, you have a reactor that is critical when the fuel is uh, still, you start the pump, the fuel starts to move, the reactivity goes down. Of course, I'm oversimplifying because in, in a real case, you have also the feedbacks coming from uh, the change in temperature and so on. But the, the fundamental information that I wanted to convey here is this, the fuel motion has an impact on K effective. Then there is another impact that relates the, uh, to, the, to the role of delay neutrons. Their role is reduced is reduced because part of them go outside of the core, do not exist for the core. So in general, we may say that uh, the delay neutron importance role, I'm using role, but I'm also using the word importance, is reduced. How do we measure that? With the quantity that is called the effective delay neutron fraction, beta effective. I'm not showing you the formula. You can find it in many books. Uh, the idea is that you evaluate the importance of delayed emission, so ratio, importance of delayed emission divided by importance of total emission. How do you evaluate such importance? Because you take the total emission and you weight them on the importance function. That is the solution of the joint problem. I'm not discussing the details of the mathematics of it uh, because of lack of time, but I'm giving you also hints if you want to in, if you want to dig deeper in these various aspects. General statement that uh, I believe that any nuclear engineer would kill me for saying it in, very, in such simple terms, the bit effective value has an impact on the speed of the response of the system. In general, we may say that if we have a system with a higher bit effective, the, 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 the promptness of the system in uh, uh, modifying its state as a response to a perturbation uh, is lower. So the higher bit effective implies a slower evolving system, therefore an easier control. Keep, keep it in mind. So just to give you the example of what is actually the numbers that we are dealing with, I said previously, let's consider a system that is critical with no fuel motion. So U equal to zero. This is the simplest problem ever, the one that I was uh, introducing you before. The system is critical. It has one family of precursor with a certain value of beta. 
that stays the same stays the same because uh, well bit effective also accounts for the energy related aspects but since we don't have energy here you can see that now let's move i'm sorry about that <coughs> let's move to a moving fuel so i introduce some velocity this one is one fourth of the nominal velocity in the center of the msfr well their activity goes down as I was already predicting. More importantly, the beta effective goes down. And the, the two numbers are, of course, related, not really being the same value, delta rho and delta beta effective, but they are very, very closely related. And more importantly, what do we see? The distribution of the lane neutron precursors is completely different. And if you play around with the numbers, so if you change the characteristics of this family, you will see differences. I'm going to show you this parametric analysis in the exercise session. I just wanted to show you here that it has an impact that is relevant on the delay neutron precursors, not that, not that much on the flux that is basically unperturbed, but it has an impact on the reactivity and the value of bit effective. <coughs> now, since I don't want to, to go over the time that I was uh, given, so recap, displacement associated to advection that we uh, can observe for uh, the emission, the, the delayed emission from fission. We have a recirculation of, of uh, delayed neutron precursors in the primary circuit, so emission outside. As a result, a stronger coupling to thermal hydraulics, a reactivity effect that is visible in steady state and also in transient situation, a reduced role of delayed neutron, so in principle we may say a faster dynamics, more importantly, the necessity of dedicated code developments, because you cannot just use the code that has been developed for PWR and use it for a molten salt reactors, because it's missing such a code, the old one. Physical phenomena that are peculiar of molten salt reactor, and this is something that justifies and is the motivation of the research projects of some of our in the past, of the current project some of safer. We need to work in this direction. This wording is extremely significant in, in motivating the work that is carried out in the frame of some of safer. Then let's talk, let's spend the last 10 to 15 minutes talking about the second topic that in any case will be treated in more detail in the, in the advanced lecture. As I said, the design of the first molten salt reactor experiment was a, a thermal spectrum. So it was a fuel flow in this bank of pipes and then there was graphite around. The thermal spectrum has a few, a couple of implications that uh, justifies also a lot of publication that you may see, let's say, that are rather old with respect when they have like 15 years old, let's say. Well, of course, there is a neutronic effect, the fact that uh, uh, the thermal spectrum implies a higher importance of delayed neutrons. Why? Because they are emitted at a lower energy. So I'm, uh, I'm connecting back to slide eight when I was showing you the spectrum of delayed neutrons. Delayed neutrons are lower in energy, so they are already closer in a sense, to the thermal range where they can produce new fission in a thermal reactor. So this is the motivation of the comment regarding the fact that they have a higher importance. And somehow this, we may say that it could compensate a little bit, not that much, the effect of the fuel motion that is anyway reducing the role of the delay neutrons. Also, there is some kind of an easier fluid dynamics. If you look at old papers, you will see that many times the flow was modeled in very simple way, like a one dimensional flow through the pipe and it was okay. The plug flow hypothesis was working very well. Well, the current design is fast. So we need to re rethink, uh, uh, we had, let's say, because it was already done, to rethink a lot of uh, aspects. As we said, the core is homogeneous, there are no moderator elements. It's quite large, I'm talking about uh, three, uh, two meters height. So it's not a small system, the, the active uh, region, let's say. As a result, the thermal fluid dynamics is extremely more complicated and it requires experimental validation because uh, you're not only studying a very large system with the uh, um, vorticity, so the fact that you, a flow uh, that is much more, a flow path that are much more complicated than the plug flow hypothesis I mentioned before. 
you have also to remember that this is a fluid that is generating heat in itself. So you need the experimental validation and you will see next week in the second module that there will be a very nice description of the experimental activities in SAMOSAFER that are trying to address all these aspects that are extremely relevant to, to, to let's say, to support the, the statement regarding the safety of this reactor design. There are also other necessities that are more related to my, my field, like the neutronic modeling. And the typical thing that came to my mind that I wanted to share is the fact that when you're studying a PWR, a thermal reactor, uh, if you look at any code uh, studying PWR, you have two energy groups. You are studying the fast neutrons and the thermal neutrons because the spectrum of neutrons is really characterized by these two populations interacting. When you go to the fast system, the spectrum, so the character energy characteristics of the system is completely different. This is why, and it's not irrelevant, you have to use more energy groups. So it's going to be a problem that in any case will be more challenging computationally speaking, just for the fact that you have more variables, okay? Then the question is, what are the motivations to go for a fast reactor? Well, I'm going to mention the typical motivations to develop fast reactors that you can find in books. That, and again, I'm looking at the, the typical standard reference for fast reactors. So you go to fast reactor for the ob objective of breeding new fuel, for the objective of burning minor actinides from exhaust fuel, and also for the potentiality of adopting innovative fuel cycles. All of these aspects are common to, the, let's say, the fast reactor designs. And if you look at the first chapters of both these books, you will find the, um, the description in more details regarding the motivation for the interest in fast reactor. I'm just giving you a few hints of what I believe Girgi will treat much better and much more in detail in, uh, after the break. So what do, what do I mean by breed? Breeding means, breeding fuel means produce new fuel. What are the two ingredients that we need to have in order to breed new fuel? We need a material that is able to breed, so it's able to produce new fuel, and what, this is what is called fertile material, and of course also the presence of neutrons to produce this, such breeding. Why? When we're talking about fertile material, we might be talking about uranium-238 that by neutronic capture produces uranium-239, then you have two radioactive decays, you get plutonium-239, which is a fissile element, a fissile isotope. This is the sketch of the typical uranium-plutonium cycle. Of course, if you keep on looking at that and you consider that other neutron capture may happen, of course, you may also produce elements that are beyond plutonium, other elements that have a, a series of problems. Some of them are fissile, some others are not. Generically speaking, we may call them minor actinides, and these are the ones that are also responsible for the long-term radiotoxicity of the spent fuel. So, of course, it's a nice thing that you're generating other fuel, but you are also carrying around some very uh, compelling problems. Innovative fuel cycle, I mentioned before, thorium fuel cycle. Thorium is an element that is available in a kind of homogeneous form, well, more or less in uh, everywhere, let's say, in the planet. Uh, it's more uh, uh, distributed than uranium in some sense, and it is fertile as well. So by neutron capture, it's able to produce uranium-233 which is fissile as well. And since you are, let's say, farther from uh, minor actinides, in principle, a cycle based on thorium produces less minor actinides. So th this is one of the, in another motivation for the interest in thorium. So the fertile material is possible. It exists and we can use it. it could it be uranium-238 or thorium-232? Then, as I said, we need to have neutrons to produce breeding because we need the neutron to do the capture first and then there are the decay and the production of the fissile material. Well, so we need to think about how many neutrons we have available for breeding. These are the typical quantities that uh, when uh, discussing fast reactors are used to evaluate the potentiality for breedings. You start from the neutrons produced by fission, nu. This is nu bar. Uh, I was changing the notation, I realized. So the average number of neutrons produced by fission. Well, it is larger than one, and this is good because we want to, uh, otherwise we wouldn't have a fission chain. But now we would uh, 
light wave is even bigger in the sense that one neutron continues the chain when another neutron is producing new fissile material and then there is, if there is something else okay it could be gone in uh, parasitic capturing structural material leakages so we need basically this number to be larger than two for sure if you look at the value of this number looking as a function of the energy of the incident neutron for the fission phenomenon you notice that if you have fission in the fast spectrum so if the fission is induced in a fast spectrum this number becomes bigger for all fissile materials so in principle if you move to the fast spectrum you have more neutrons around and this is the motivation to go for a fast spectrum then there is the other comment here that if you go to a fast spectrum in principle all isotopes even the fertile ones are easier to undergo fission so you are exploiting better the material that you are placing inside your reactor in terms of using it for the generation of energy there is another parameter that is rather used more than new that is called eta reproduction factor that is lower in fact you see it's equal to new times a coefficient that is anyway lower than one because you have also to consider the fact that every time a neutron interacts with a fissile element is not said that is always going to be a fission it may also be a capture so you are accounting for that with this alpha that is the capture to fission ratio end of the story eta is even better as a parameter to be to be studied because if eta is smaller than two no way you cannot do any breeding because in, you don't even have in this uh, the idealized condition one neutron to produce the to continue the fission and one neutron to breed if then you look at the behavior of eta you notice you have a confirmation of the fact that you need to go to fast spectrum because if you go in the in the thermal range you see that you are below the the straight line that is two so Eta is a parameter that has always been used in order to study the characteristics of breeding. Girgi is going to, the, 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 to uh, show you, well, some more advances with respect to these very basic quantities that are the, the baseline for understanding the, the, the subject that I just explained now. And therefore, you have to, to stick around for the second part of, the, of this module. As I said, in fast spectrum in principle all transuranic isotopes have some probability to fission so if you are in fast spectrum you may say i'm using better all the isotopes that i have around even the minor actinides so the msfr and this is another way a reason why it can be very interesting connect as a minor actinide burner so you uh, have the chance to reduce the long-term radiotoxicity of spent fuel by transmute and this is what is called the transmutation there is a lot of research in the field of partitioning so separate and then transmute uh, minor actinides the fast spectrum may allow you to, to also to act positively in this direction even though and I have to because you have to be fair there is uh, an issue that is uh, in general related, related to minor actinides with uh, a, a, an additional caveat being a molten salt reactor. If you look at the value of the delay neutron fraction for some actinides, some of them are very small. Some others are very big, but if you take, for instance, plutonium 240, that is uh, fertile, but it is fissile in fast spectrum, you have uh, 310, that is less than one half than uranium 235. So it's very small. If you then on top of that, you, you add the fact that you have the fuel motion, which reduces the role of delayed neutrons, you see that the, 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 the dynamics of a molten salt reactor with the loading involving also this, uh, this uh, element, these isotopes, requires to be carefully assessed by the point of view of safety. And this is, again, justifying all the uh, research activity that are carried out in this sense. Takeaway message. Well, so MSFR have the potentialities to meet the generation for goal and the goals, and that's the reason why they are part of generation for reactor designs. I was trying with this discussion on neutronics to highlight in particular some positive effects on the, the, the field reg fields regarding sustainability in terms of how you can effectively use the fuel. So if you also do breeding, you are using the fuel because you are using even uranium-238. You are fast spectrum, you are 
you are even doing fission with uh, uranium-238 and, and all the other uh, isotopes. This helps in the management of nuclear waste with the reduction of the long-term burn. And so all these aspects go in the direction of answering the request in terms of sustainability of Gen 4. What about safety and reliability? Well, there are peculiarities. They need to be carefully considered. And as I stated more than once, the safety assessment are a crucial field of research for the, for the previous projects and for this project for some safer as well aiming at proving the safety characteristics of MSFR. And for the people who know Latin, nomen, omen, our project is somehow safer because our objective is to prove the excellence in safety of this reactor design. With this, I, I finish my contribution here. I will mainly focus on one aspect on fuel, of fuel cycle, uh, uh, particularly on neutronics. I will not address the other aspects. So with this, let me start. I hope you see the slides moving. This, my presentation yes. has seven parts. With very basic definitions, I will start speak about primordial and synthetic actinides, nuclear fuel cycle, its performance and equilibrium state. And firstly, in the second half, I will come to MSR definition MSR taxonomy and MSR performance from fuel cycle perspective. So I would like to start with the definitions and I did small exercise because of this lecture and I was looking for etymology of the word, word fuel to find the obvious. Fuel is uh, food for the fire, you can say, or actually something burnable. And that's the reason why we also say by analogy that nuclear reactors are burning they, their fuel. And this analogy is not so stupid because actually fire as well as fission are chain reactions. So now, uh, what is fuel cycle? You can de define it as a, in general as a chain uh, to process chain to obtain energy. Compared to that, closed cycle, in closed cycles, some substances are cycling or are recycled and does not leave the cycle. So if you are interested to read about closed cycle, you can uh, Google uh, circular economy and uh, it works already quite well, for instance, for steel. Now you can combine fuel cycle and closed cycle. And I use this nice example from nature, which is however partly wrong because in this cycle, the nutrients as resources are really cycling, but the energy is not really cycling. Yes, the energy is provided by the fusion in the, in the, in the star, in the sun. So uh, is this cycle closed or open, you can ask. And it is the same question as if uh, solar energy is renewable or not. And the answer depends on the time span. Yes. So for instance, coal can be once renewed, but the time span makes it uninteresting for us. From this perspective, a nuclear fuel cycle is definitely open. Yes, there is nothing uh, which we can do to close it. But the fuel itself, the actinides, they can cycle until they are efficient. So this is what we understand when we say closed cycle. It's cycling of actinides. Saying that, uh, uh, let's have a look what is actual fuel for our reactors. So you, you need to fulfill two conditions. You need a nuclide whose fission produce energy and simultaneously neutrons, which are capable of, of consecutive fission. So you find these nuclides, uh, the complete tail of the nuclides chart, where there are the nuclides which, with neutron excess. And our fuel are actually actinides, which have been created by rapid neutron capture, probably, presumably, in supernova, by supernova explosion. Unfortunately, all these uh, actinides are unstable and decay through radioactive decay. And we have only three nuclides uh, present on the Earth at the moment. It is thorium-232, uranium-238, and uranium-235. Okay, from now on, I will call them sh shorter way, like thorium-2, uranium-8, and uranium-5. There is one more, plutonium-44, which nearly made it too. You may have some traces on the Earth. And if, I, if you look now on the chart on the right top, there is some obvious repetitiveness, yes? 
And this repetitiveness is based on uh, the pairing effect of neutrons and protons. So there is a, a repetitive uh, line uh, which follows uh, plus two protons and plus four neutrons. And this is valid for a uh, majority of the actinides, actually, this repetitiveness. But saying that, you must admit that there is one outlier and it's plutonium-41. Compared to his neighbors, uranium-5 and curium-7, plutonium-41 has very short half-life and decays through beta minus decay, which is unusual. So we are lucky to have a very stable uranium-5. It's a present of nature for us. At the same time, uh, uh, there is a question how it can be that uranium-5 was originated by neutron capture. And the answer is fission barrier. Along the air process, rapid neutron capture process pass, you have so neutron-rich nuclides that the fission barrier is very high. So they don't fission during this process in supernova. And firstly, later they are decaying to the actinides area we are used to. Now having this chart on the screen, let's have a, a look on our fuel area. And in, in this area, the fission barrier gets lower when more protons are closer to each other because of the repulsive forces of protons. If they are too close to each other, they don't want to be anymore so close to each other. Now, knowing this, we can define what does it mean fissile. Fissile means that the barrier is smaller than the binding energy of the interacting neutron. Now, uh, the neutron likes to be in pairs, so uh, binding energy is higher for odd n isotopes, for isotopes with odd neutron number. So therefore, uranium-3, 5, 7 are fissile, and uranium-4, 6, 8, or thorium-2 are not fissile. We call them sometimes fertile. Okay, in case of uranium-7, it's in parentheses because the barrier is quite high already there, so it's not so much fissile. So, uh, what are the basic characteristics of primordial actinides? First of all, they are not renewable, unless you can repeat supernova somehow uh, friendly nearby. Their re, uh, reserves are correlated with uh, uh, the half-lives and uranium-5 is the only fissile, fissile nuclide. It can produce neutrons which can cause uh, another fission. Now, uh, thorium-2 and uranium-8 are only fissionable by fast neutrons, so the neutrons need to carry extra energy to cause the fission. And uh, the neutrons they release by this fission uh, have an average lower energy, so we cannot uh, create a chain reaction. So they uh, mainly undergo transmutation, they mainly capture the neutron. Now, uh, uh, next information about primordial nuclides is that uh, in nature we have a mixture of uranium-5 and 8, they are not separated. And the natural uranium has only 0.7% of uranium-5, so its fission probability is quite low. It is around 50% in thermal spectrum, so you can use it as a fuel only with uh, the most efficient moderators like heavy water or graphite. And what we usually do, we enrich the uranium, we increase the uranium-5 content typically to 5%, so that the fission probability is uh, around 80%. And then you can use this fuel also with light water, which is already kind of capturing neutrons much more. But you can still not use it with fast reactors. So the limit for enrichment is 20% and such a fuel has already quite reasonable chance for fission also in fast spectrum. So you can use it without any moderator. Now, since the fission can fail, all three uh, primordial uh, actinides can be transmuted, can undergo transmutation by neutron capture to create synthetic actinides. And these synthetic actinides can either undergo a next neutron capture or decay by beta minus to create another uh, synthetic actinides and so on and so on. Here uh, in the reactor, there are three basic reactions, uh, if not uh, accounting for fission, for transmutation. It's neutron capture, it's beta minus, radioactive decay, and it's end-to-end -end reactions. And all these three reactions are actually altering the neutron number just by one. So you are always changing odd neutron number to even neutron number or uh, uh, contrawise. So having this on the screen, I would like to define some very trivial terms. So burning is nothing else than actinides fission. Breeding is transmutation 
which can be optionally followed by two decays, which is increasing fission probability. So you change even n to odd n. And parasitic neutron capture is transmutation, optionally followed by one decay, where you are not increasing the fission probability. So you, it's odd n to even n, or even n transmuted by neutron capture, followed up by uh, radioactive decay, again ending by even n. This is the case of uh, neutron capture on uranium-6, where you create uranium-7 and fastly, promptly decay to neptunium-7. So what are the basic characteristics of synthetic actinides? There are two major synthetic actinides. It's uh, uranium-3 and plutonium-9, and they are part of so-called thorium, uranium, and uranium-plutonium cycles. So both are fissile, obviously, because they have odd neutron number. But uranium-3 uh, has much higher uh, probability of fission. It's up to nine, up to 990 percent of fission probability. And this is the biggest advantage of the thorium cycle. Whereas for plutonium, the fission probability is only around 60 to 75 percent. In the same uh, uh, parameter, uh, uranium-8 is better than thorium. It's roughly 10 times more fissionable than thorium. But what is the biggest advantage of plutonium? Uh, Sandra already mentioned, you, you have 2.9 neutrons produced uh, per fission. And this is really the strongest advantage of uranium-plutonium cycle, because uranium-3 produces only 2.5 neutrons per fission. In this category, uh, uranium-8 is also better than thorium because it produces more neutrons. And the last thing I would like to say on this slide is that the half-life of uh, protactinium is 11 times uh, longer than for neptunium and it has two consequences. At equal decay rates you have 11 times more protactinium and possibly parasitic capture of protactinium in your system than in the corresponding uranium-plutonium system and your fuel, your uranium-3 is born with months of delays. So it may be kind of uh, problematic for some cases. So synthetic actinides are actually cool. They are acting as a catalyzer for self-sustaining breeding because uh, thorium-8, uh, thorium-2 and uranium-8 acts as a wet fuel. You cannot do a fire with them. But if you have fire ongoing, which is fueled by plutonium-9 or uranium-3, you can put this wood to the fire, it will dry out and then burn to produce energy. And you can do it until your re uh, reactor will be not stopped by fission products because fission products, if they are not removed, they will uh, capture too many neutrons finally. Synthetic actinides are at the same time as Tevar chip burden because they have half-lives which are too short for them to be primordial. At the same time, once they are generated, uh, they have quite long half-lives to disappear swiftly. And now there is a, a kind of issue with radioactive materials. If something is decaying fast, it has high activity, but the storage time is short. If it is decaying slowly, then the storage is long, but the activity is slow. So the worst you can have, the long-term stewardship burden is caused by medium half-lives. So typically from spent LWR fuel, it is plutonium isotopes which are causing the uh, uh, a long, uh, you can hear sometimes 100,000 years storing time before it reaches some natural uh, uh, radiotoxicity. Furthermore, they are decaying, synthetic actinides are decaying in chains, so it's not so straightforward to evaluate uh, the storing time, the radiotoxicity. So now I uh, haven't speak about nuclear fuel cycle so far, so let me start. Uh, a nuclear fuel cycle has uh, uh, basically two parts. It's so-called front end, which covers everything from exploration, um, mining, milling, conversion, enrichment, up to fabrication, and back end, uh, everything after irradiation, so interim storage, transportation, uh, reprocessing, partitioning, transmutation, and waste disposal. What I address in my presentation today is actually the part in between, so it's the irradiation part is the reactive physics aspect of nuclear fuel cycle. So now uh, there are basically five major fuel cycle types. The first one is enriched uranium burning. So more or less you burn uranium-5 mainly in this cycle. And this cycle is generally open and waste intensive. However, you can recycle 
the irradiated uranium and generated plutonium as so-called MOX fuel. The resource utilization is below 1%. So you utilize uh, uh, less than 1% of natural uranium in such a cycle. The second cycle is closed thorium uranium cycle. So this is a cycle which burns thorium 2 in closed cycle. And uh, the efficiency, the resource utilization here can be up to 95% of thorium because of the reprocessing losses, which you cannot avoid completely. Similarly, there is closed uranium plutonium cycle, burning uranium 8 in closed cycle with uh, equal uh, utilization of 95% roughly. But then there is also breed and burn uranium plutonium cycle, which is actually uranium 8 burning in, so, in open cycle. Uh, in that case, we have a fairly waste intensive cycle, but the fuel can be recycled or reused in another reactor. And the utilization range from 20 to 30 percent of natural uranium. And the last cycle is dedicated synthetic actinides burning, where the utilization is more or less not relevant. Of course, you can combine these cycles and you can transit between these cycles. So you have many options, but uh, those are the five basic cycles I identified. If somebody, somebody of you have, have an idea, we can, uh, you can send a proposal for another cycle which was forget, forgotten. Now, these cycles can be put into a chain, so-called scenarios, which usually depends on the national regulation or national program or vision of a country. So in USA, for instance, there is a ban on reprocessing. So the irradiated fuel is considered a waste, as is. In Switzerland, we used to recycle, it's also not allowed anymore. So the recycled MOX was irradiated once again in light water reactor. In France, uh, such a, a recycled and irradiated MOX was meant to be used in fast reactor, in sodium fast reactor to multi-recycle the plutonium and minor actinides were considered as a waste. Now they uh, actually changed the strategy, they postpone the fast uh, reactor de uh, reactors deployment, and they will consider a second recyclation of MOX in light water reactors. In Russia, the MOX fuel is recycled directly in fast reactors, and they foresee molten salt reactor as a dedicated minor actinides burner. And in India, they have very special scenario starting from natural uranium generating MOX, using it in fast reactor to irradiate thorium and using the generated uranium-3 as a fuel for a heavy water uh, reactor. In China, more or less, everything is evaluated. But... Now, we have five major fissile fuels. Thorium-2 and uranium-8, they fulfill the definition of fuel because they can be efficient, but they need two neutrons to be efficient. So they are not fissile, they are fertile. But the five major fissile fuel materials are reactor-grade plutonium, so the plutonium we obtain from irradiation light water reactor, which, which has medium availability and medium proliferation risk. Then there is low enriched uranium with high availability and low medium proliferation risk. High enriched uranium with high availability, but also high proliferation risk. Uranium-3 with very low availability, single tons probably somewhere around the world, and high proliferation risk and weapon-grade plutonium. Medium availability, there is some plutonium around the world with high proliferation risk. So if you are not a power country, you can forget about the last three uh, fissile materials. We are left with reactor-grade plutonium and low-enriched uranium. Other synthetic actinides we don't need to consider. And I would like to point out here that these two materials, reactor-grade plutonium and low-enriched uranium, can be uh, demanding or complicated uh, to use to start the thorium uranium cycle. Okay, so let me go closer to the topic I should address actually. So how do you assess the neutronic performance of fuel cycle? I would say there are five criteria. First one is breeding capability. So how many neutrons can be captured on thorium-2 or uranium-8 so that the reactor is still critical? And of course, this is about neutron economy. And here I would like to say that MSR has the potential advantage of absence of structure, structural materials. Second parameter is achievable burn-up. So uh, it's limited by fission products 
creation and by uh, fuel irradiation stability. And here, uh, I would like to mention the radiation stability of the soils. It's ionic liquid, they can recombine easily, so uh, they are more or less infinite from this perspective. Initial fissile mass. So how much uh, fissile material you need so that your reactor is critical? Of course, it depends on neutron economy, it depends on the spectrum of the reactor, but it also depends on the expected burn-up because a higher burn-up may impose higher initial reserve. Here I would like to mention that molten salt reactors may rely on online refueling because of the liquid fuel and online removal of some fission products. Fourth parameter is a, a means of criticality maintenance. So there was the question about control rods. Irradiation of actinides and fission products creation results in re reactivity oscillation. So you need a method to compensate for this reactivity thing. And these methods differ between reactors. Uh, in when you do, your fuel is liquid, you have a chan, chance to reshape your core, or in the ultimate case, even drain the core. But also, the uh, online refueling and removal of fission products helps you to minimize the reactivity swing. The last parameter is transportation capability, and this capability is expressed by neutron costs: how many neutrons you need to transmit, and how fast you can do it. And of course, it depends on uh, your uh, synthetic actinized compatibility with the fuel and fabrication process. And here I would like to mention absence of fabrication process for MSRs and solubility of the actinides as the actual limit. Now, we don't have time to discuss all these five criteria, so I will focus on the breeding capability and show you a classification of reactors by breeding capability into four types. First type is burner which more or less avoids uranium-8 or thorium-2 and is dedicated for uh, synthetic actinides minimization. Second type is converter, typically enriched uranium burner, which has a little bit of uh, leftover uranium-5 in the spent fuel and a little bit of generated plutonium. Third type is breeder, which has in the spent fuel equal or bigger amount of fissile material than in the fresh fuel. And last type is breed and burn reactor, which has fissile material in the spent fuel, but, but where there is no fissile material in the fresh fuel. Since this is a very peculiar cycle type, I have one more slide to uh, illustrate it. So in case of solid fuel, the reactor is critical. That in average, there is enough fissile material. And the assembly you are removing is the most burned assembly, and the assembly you are uh, feeding is without anything fissile. So it's cool uh, fuel cycle is self-sustaining breeding cycle where uh, recycling or reprocessing is not needed. You can do the same with liquid fuel reactor with MSR. The, the difference there is that the fuel you are discharging is not the most burn, but it's the average fuel, which has the advantage that you may use it later for later in a, another reactor of the same time type. Of course, you can consider also multi-liquid layout to utilize your uh, leakage a little bit uh, uh, better, but then the spent fuel is not the average one and it's not so straightforward to start another rig. Okay, let's speak now about uh, actinides recycling versus breeding capability and uh, about equilibrium state. So uh, recycling and breeding are two different things. You can close the cycle, you can recycle actinides in burner, converter and breeder. In a uh, and burn reactor, it obviously doesn't make sense, but you can uh, reuse the spent fuel in another reactor. Now, recycling is the ultimate waste reduction. So the minimization of synthetic actinides can be really achieved only with recycling or recycling of the fuel. Recycling in a breeder means also the highest utilization because it is limited uh, purely by the uh, reprocessing losses. I will not go to detail here. Uh, you have a chart on the uh, right top, but I would like to mention here that for MSR, uh, there is a potential risk or a weakness of low burn-up at reprocessing. So when you have low burn-up at reprocessing, you should be very careful what are your reprocessing losses, because your utilization can uh, drastically drop if you are not careful or uh, efficient enough. Recycling in converter, medium resource utilization, it, it is uh, given by the enrichment process because converter needs enriched fuel and there is always leftover depleted uranium. 
somewhere uh, laying around. Recycling in a burner is mainly dedicated for the waste minimization. Now, fuel recycling, or generally fuel long irradiation, leads to equilibrium fuel composition. So if uh, your fuel cycle parameters are fixed and you recycle your fuel, you end up at equilibrium fuel composition, which depends finally only on the feed. So if you feed thorium-2 or uranium-8, obviously it depends on the, also on the neutron spectrum, which is on the other hand, strongly co-determined by scattering materials, by coolant or structural materials. And fuel and the spectrum together they determine your multiplication factor. So you have an equilibrium state, it's inherent core state, it's Bateman matrix eigenstate, uh, described by fuel composition spectrum and reactivity. And uh, if you know the equilibrium reactivity, you can assess how big is the potential breathing gain of the system. Of course, if you simulate closed fuel cycle, uranium plutonium cycle in thermal reactor, you will end up with negative reactivity but you will still get the feeling what is the breeding potential of the reactor. Now, the equilibrium composition is more or less identical to uh, irradiation chain. So we have now here one slide showing an irradiation chain. And I will not go to detail discussing this chain because what we provided you, what we will provide you is a MATLAB script which can uh, plot or create such a uh, irradiation chains for uh, several selected MSR systems. So you can have a look yourself uh, and analyze these uh, charts. Okay, let me start now. So what is the definition of molten salt reactor? So according to IEA, MSR is any reactor where molten salt has a prominent role in the reactor core. It can be fuel, coolant, and or moderator. So moderator, it is very rarely. It is more often coolant, although it is uh, fuel, but most frequently, as Sandra said, it is fuel and coolant in one. Now, uh, uh, I have a few slides speaking about coolants because I would like to characterize the salts. So there are four major coolant types, water, light and heavy, liquid metals, sodium, lead, lead bismuth, gases and salts, fluorides and chlorides. Now you can, you can have a look on the capture cross sections of these nuclides, where I, I, select, uh, I select lithium-7 as a kind of a border, it's a, the red curve, and everything with lower capture cross section is green, and everything with higher capture cross section is brown. And you see there are differences, but capture is not the only parameter you should watch. The second parameter is the scattering cross section, which will determine your uh, spectrum of the reactor or co-determine strongly the spectrum of your reactor. And you see the colors are now uh, fairly mixed, so the capture scattering cross-sections are not correlated. Since it is very hard to discuss these charts, what I did, I averaged the cross-sections in two areas. In the range around 0 0.1 electron volt, where the thermal spectrum is usually peaking, and in the range around 0 0.1 mega electron volt, where the fast spectrum is typically peaking. If you do this averaging, you obtain, for instance, the thermal scattering cross-section shown on the slide for thermal neutrons. You see there is, of course, hydrogen as the number one, is the moderating beast, but it is followed by uh, chlorine-35 and lead. So this is not really helping us. What we know, need to know is kind of moderating power. So we need to put in the picture also the logarithmic decrement of energy, which express how much energy neutron lose by one scattering occurrence. And what I selected is a product of these two parameters, uh, which I called moderation power. So if you multiply thermal scattering cross section, I call it thermal moderation power. And you see the usual suspected. There is hydrogen, deuterium, beryllium, carbon, but there is still chlorine certified somehow. It's, it's funny. And everything below oxygen, we don't consider a moderator. Even oxygen is probably not considered a moderator. Now you need to know also what is the capture cross section. So the thermal, the, uh, thermal uh, capture cross section is quite high for chlorine certified. So this is the reason why we don't consider it or don't use it as a moderate. But it is also extremely high for lithium-6. So this is the reason why we are enriching lithium sometimes when we are using it. Uh, and it is quite high for materials which you typically know rather for fast reactors like sodium 
or even chlorine 37 you can probably you should probably not use chlorine at all in the thermal spectrum then there is also fast moderation power where uh, the situation repeats there is hydrogen deuterium beryllium but suddenly there is fluorine which is stronger than carbon and also magnesium and lithium has higher moderation power than in thermal spectrum the reason for that is presence of uh, quite broad uh, uh, scattering cross uh, scattering uh, uh, resonances in at this area at this area of 0 0.1 mega electron volt finally the fast capture cross section you don't care much about it you can afford everything maybe lithium 6 you cannot afford it's uh, too much uh, absorbing and of course if you would like to use chlorides chloride salts you can enrich it to chlorine 37 because it has uh, let's say three four times uh, lower capture cross section now using these results you can categorize uh, the coolants by four characteristics if it is moderator yeah we have four typical moderators if it is suppressing fast neutrons the four moderators are suppressing the fast neutrons but also the nuclides with resonances so fluorine magnesium lithium they are also suppressing fast neutron spectrum if you can breathe in thermal spectrum with this coolant yes you can breathe in all moderators but hydrogen and uh, if you can breathe in fast spectrum here you avoid moderators and in case of fluorine i have the three stars comment yes you can but your spectrum is terribly soft so it is the softest spectrum of all fast reactors now i don't have much time to discuss further but i have one slide about structural materials and uh, i would like to point out here that nickel has twice higher capture cross section than iron so using nickel in uh, any reactor core it's uh, reducing strongly the performance okay uh, something about msrs msr taxonomy molten salt reactors is entire category of reactors and there are three major classes it's graphite based molten salt reactors homogeneous molten salt reactors and heterogeneous molten salt reactors these classes can be further subdivided into families and types for graphite based msrs it is typically fluoride salt cooled reactors and graphite moderated msr for homogeneous msrs it is uh, homogeneous fluoride fast and homogeneous chloride fast msrs for heterogeneous msrs it is non-graphite moderated msrs and heterogeneous chloride fast msrs okay now now not all msr concepts which you find in literature will fit these three major families or classes sorry six major families so there is another class of others where typically outdated uh, uh, designs are included now i have six slides to introduce the six families i will go quite swiftly through them but once again you can have a look later so fluoride salt cooled reactors they differ by uh, fuel shape if it is pebble bed fuel or fixed fuel the primary heat exchange takes place in core because there is dedicated coolant which is lithium beryllium uh, eutectic salt of fluoride so fluoride salts fuel form is trisoparticles in graphite matrix and there is no structural materials uh, there are no structural materials in the core because uh, graphite is compatible with the salt such a reactor cannot breathe and it's uh, usually for a thing for enriched uranium uh, converting the coolant salt this uh, eutectic salt has certain moderate moderation power so it has negative density effect which is important for the safety and uh, uh, some of the concepts which rely on trisoparticles uh, dispersed in the graphite matrix may have a quite low specific fuel density now for each of the families i have uh, one illustration and i typically choose uh, one of the oldest to to be fair between the systems the second family graphite moderated msrs very similar with the difference that the fuel is now diluted in the salt and the graphite is purely for moderation purposes in the core so the heat exchange take place x core because uh, the liquid fuel uh, acts as a, a convention medium so it's convecting the heat out of the core and firstly then there is heat exchange between some medias such a reactor can act as a breeder but uh, it's quite tough to achieve breeding and in this case uh, the specific fuel density can be higher 
but the limited graphite lifespan is the only reason for graphite exchange because there is no fuel inside. Astoloid vessel is protected, so you don't need to exchange it so often. And if you want to breed, you need to remove fission products very fast and separate protactinium. Third family, homogeneous fluoride fast reactors. Uh, they have two types defined by fuel cycle. So uh, fluoride fast uh, thorium uranium breeder or plutonium containing fluoride fast reactor. Actinides are diluted in the salt. Heat exchange take place ex core. There are no structural materials and the system can act as a breeder, of course. Uh, unfortunately, the vessel is exposed to neutrons, so you need to exchange it uh, regularly. And if you use uh, lithium fluoride salt, uh, you have one of the softest spectra. Uh, the design we have on the figure was probably using lithium beryllium eutectic. I'm not sure now, uh, but then it can it can almost be considered as moderated. The fourth family is our homogeneous fluoride fast reactors, very similar to the previous one, just you replace fluorides with chlorides. Of course, you can breed, and here you can even achieve breed and burn mode. Uh, also, here the vessel is irradiated, and uh, the spectrum is one of the hardest because of absence of scattering uh, cross sections. The, the chlorides are not so much scattering compared to fluorides. But you pay for the hardest spectra with uh, large cores because uh, uh, the salt is transparent for neutrons. So this is also the reason why it is not so suitable for thorium cycle. Fifth family, non-graphite moderated MSRs. It's a little bit complicated to discuss because uh, there are two types uh, defined by moderator state, solid or liquid moderator. So the primary heat exchange take place X core in one case. If you have solid moderator, then the salt, the fuel salt is liquid and acts as a convection medium convection medium. In case of liquid moderator, you can choose if salt or moderator will be the heat exchange medium. So the salt can be stationary in the core. Uh, the structural material. Uh, has consequences, has limited lifespan, and strongly determines your neutronic performance. So, uh, self-sustaining breeding is nearly impossible, and probably it is possible only with silicon carbide. The sixth family, heterogeneous chloride fast reactors, has two types, which are defined by coolant type. So, you have salt-cooled and lead-cooled heterogeneous fast MSRs. So, in this case, heat exchange take place in core because the fuel doesn't need to be pumped. There are some designs where it may be pumped, but it doesn't need to be pumped extensively for heat exchange purposes. And this is the advantage, actually. This is why you go for it, because then your coolant is less radioactive and you can organize better your uh, conversion system. But there is structural material in the reactor, so it reduces your performance. A breed and burn in this case is almost impossible. It's very demanding. Also here, the structural material has limited lifespan and reduced the performance. At the same time, it provides additional scattering cross-section, which is desperately missing in chloride salts. So after all, you may have lower K infinity, but possibly also smaller reactor cores. Now, what is the breeding performance? I'm entering the very last uh, part of my presentation. So let's firstly have a look on moderated molten salt reactors. So what we did, we took five fluoride salts, the most kind of reasonable, and six selected six moderators, and we did a parametric study. Now, each block of this matrix is a parametric study where on uh, X axis, we have been alternating the salt share in the core. So on the left, you have moder very moderated reactors, on the right, almost the fast reactor. And on the Y axis, we alternated the channel radius. So let's say the heterogeneity, yes. And what, we, and what, what it, the plot shows is equilibrium uh, K infinity. Everything that is below one is white. But you can conclude here that the lithium fluoride is the best salt, that beryllium based moderators and heavy water moderators are the best neutronic performing moderators. But I must say the separating material, the cladding, was not included in this study. Graphite, oh, sorry, uh, anhydride or hydrogen-based moderators, so zirconium hydride and water, 
they cannot breathe because the capture cross section of uh, hydrogen or M zirconium. Graphite is not at all the best moderator, but it's the only one compatible with the salt. Therefore, we have graphite uh, moderated or based reactors as an entire class. Uh, beryllium and heavy water needs uh, uh, cladding, needs separation materials. So we had a look on three materials, hasteloid, stainless steel, and silicon carbide. Uh, around this area, silicon carbide seems to work. So this is the area where you have moderated thermal reactor and the full curve is without cladding and the dashed curve is with silicon carbide. You can also see that stainless steel is performing better than uh, asteroid because of the high cross section for capture of nickel. So I make always joke here. I'm waiting for somebody to come. Hey, I am here. I will do it. I have money uh, to do a PhD and to design heavy water boiling MSR because it would be really interesting multiphysic uh, case. Now, what about breathing in fast MSRs? So we took the same five salts and adds three chlo flor chloride salts. So sodium chloride with natural chlorine, sodium uh, chloride and uh, actinized chloride. So the last salt is rather uh, hypothetical, but we took it as a, let's say, a performance limit. And this is the result. This is very convoluted chart, which is showing you the excess reactivity with the last column. I don't know if you if you see it. This is the last column. The rest above is uh, how the reactivity is reduced by uh, different nuclides. So what you can what you can see on this chart that there are four salts which may work. Uh, the best performing from chlorides is the sodium chloride, the enriched one. The natural one uh, is not even critical because of the chlorine thirty five capture cross section. And from fluorides, uh, lithium fluoride is, uh, has the highest reactivity excess. So this is the reason why some of our, some of safer and Evol, all these projects focus on lithium fluoride, but you pay a little bit for it. The neighboring uh, lithium beryllium eutectic have much lower melting temperature, but also much lower performance as you see, because beryllium is a moderator. So, so you cannot speak about fast reactor. Now, uh, this discussion I did is valid for thorium cycle. I should have mentioned it, but it's a big label there. We have similar results for uranium plutonium cycle. But you can immediately see whenever there is a beryllium in the salt, you are subcritical. It's too moderated and uranium plutonium cycle is suffering from the moderation. Sodium chloride, the enriched one, is again the best performing one. And fluoride salts, there are three more or less equal performing salts. But the spectrum is too soft for uranium plutonium cycle, so uh, it's not really something breathtaking. It's possible, and you need to care about plutonium solubility. Now, what about the core size? What we discussed here was typically K infinity. So let's have a look on the uh, core size. And for comparison, I included here a picture of uh, traditional fast breeder reactors. So let sodium and gas cooled fast reactors. And you can compare them with MSFR. So the, our reference system, which will be uh, used as a reference in all other presentations of this uh, series. It's quite compact reactor. It has low key infinity, but thanks to the scattering cross section, it's quite compact. It's two and a half meters by two and a half meters, roughly speaking. If you change the fuel cycle to uranium plutonium, you need to increase the core size because the excess, uh, the K infinity is slightly lower. It's not much, but you need to increase it a little bit. Now, if you change to chlorides, uranium plutonium cycle in chlorides is almost the same size as the previous one. Yes, because the K infinity is much higher. At the same time, the core is transparent, so it's much higher leakage. So you end up by the same core size. If you change to thorium cycle, which has much lower K infinity, you already has very bulky core. It's more than four by four meters. So this is maybe the reason why nobody speaks about thorium cycle and chloride salts. And for comparison, okay, there is a molten salt breeder reactor, the graphite moderated design from Oak Ridge times. You see it's even bigger 
but uh, it has only 13% of salt. The rest was graphite, which it nonetheless needs to replace time to time. So it was still very bulky core, but not so much salt inside. Now, last, really last slide I would like to use for Britain burn. We analyzed Britain burn cycles uh, also for thorium and found that it's very hard. It's nearly impossible. This is the red curve, which is uh, barely critical. You can mix the cycle. You can mix uranium, plutonium, and thorium uranium cycle, and you obtain some reasonable criticality. But Britain burn cycle is mainly uh, for uranium, plutonium cycle. If you manage to increase the actinides content in the salt, the performance of the cycle is growing. So the K infinity is growing. And with growing K infinity, you can get smaller reactor, reactors. But even with the most dense salt, you, you still are by four by four meters. So, so uh, the breed and burn cycle is demanding, needs every neutron to be operating. So you should really minimize the leakage. And if the breeder would be two and a half or three meters uh, big, breeder, uh, breed and burn reactor would be two, two, three meter. Uh, sorry, let's say multiply by two, so four, four, five meters big, much bigger. So uh, let me swiftly conclude. I only address neutronics aspect of MSR fuel cycle. And from this perspective, you can say it has potential. Self-sustaining breeding and legacy synthetic actinides burning is possible. Uh, the reprocessing or recycling seems inherent for liquid fuels, so it really seems as a match. But other advanced reactors can perform equally, so we should evaluate carefully the performance, not to say that we are the only one or MSR is the only one. However, what I didn't address in my presentation are the other aspects. So how the fuel behaves uh, under irradiation, how it interacts with solid materials, what are the performance criteria, so about, for instance, the melting temperature, uh, uh, how to prepare, treat, condition, recycle the fuel, how to store it and immobilize. And I would like to end up with personal opinion. Actually, it is the salt melting temperature, which is or was the major obstacle for a faster MSR deployment. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you are still there. Please, questions. Thanks, Gigi. Of course, you are very well welcome to, to contribute to the, the, the question interaction. So I, I anyway proceed with the, with the, the following. Question. What is the objective of this very simple program? Is to implement what I was showing you before. And as I said, for someone who's into this, physical mathematical problems, it might be fun to solve it by yourself. Here I'm more interested in showing what happens in result and do some parametric analysis. And you can do as many as you want since you have uh, the, the possibility to play yourself with the code. This is, you see, there are a certain number of parameters that you can change. The setup, so the star, starting value are the typical value, let's say, that I used also in the lecture. So 650 PCM for beta. Lambda 0 0.1 seconds to the minus one, decay constant representative of a family of precursors. Reactor height, here I plugged 225 centimeters. That is the height of the core cavity in the MSFR. Fuel velocity, I have two, the two meters per second. That is, as you remember, the drawing I showed you during the lecture is more or less the velocity in the center of the core, uh, the, the magnitude of the velocity in the center of the core. This uh, transit time in the external circuit, so the time it takes to go all the way around, is again a number characteristics of the MSFR in correspondence to that velocity. Of course, if the velocity decreases, the transit time increases. Then there is the only mathematic point that you need to define, you need to use the number of harmonics. Harmonics are the eigenfunctions that you want to use for the solution. Here I plugged five. If you play around with that, I'm not doing it now. It's something that it's not really significant for this school. It's more, again, a mathematics nerd. Uh, you can see that you don't need so many eigenfunctions to have a good reconstruction of the results. So this five is a number that works anyway. And what happens if you use all this input data? So from here to here, you, plot, you calculate and plot. What do you get? You get, if it takes, it was working, so it should be working also this time. 
you get on the top the graph the flux and the bottom graph the concentration the precursor concentration this is something that i was already showing you in um, in uh, during the lecture the only difference is the velocity that i used in that example that was only one fourth of the nominal velocity in the msfr what and also you get the plot that is giving of course an information we were commenting it before the flux is basically unperturbed at the end of the day by the fuel motion while the precursor density might be strongly perturbed there is also another point that I want you to notice that is going to be very visible if we play around with the numbers. The value that you have, let's say, on the right, that is the top of the core. Remember that uh, this is the this is the h var, it is the vertical variable. I, I wrote x instead of z. This is uh, connected to the value at the, at the entering of the core because this depends on how long did it take for the for the precursors to go around. Some of them decayed, producing their neutron outside. Some of them survived, and these are the ones that you see as boundary condition at the entrance of the core. Of co and uh, well, and of course, if you modify the values, you will see also a difference in this. The two values that you find, the two gauge that you see on the bottom of the, the figure the, of the window show you the loss in reactivity, so rho, and the loss in beta. So exactly the same result I was giving you in numbers previously. So now we, can, we may play around quite freely with the numbers. So I'm going to change, for instance, the transit time in the external circuit. So I'm letting Sorry, everything Sandra. say. Tell me. Can you just maximize the plot, please? Yeah. Thank you. Very the much. problem is that I, I, I well, the, the, the font of the wording will not change because it's something that imposed in the app by the very beginning. This is something that I realized 10 minutes before the starting of the course. I'm sorry about that. So I don't know if it's really helping the, the visibility. Yeah, at least for the plot. The, uh, See, the... Okay, I'm sorry about that. But this is something that I realized, as I said, 10 minutes before the, the start that uh, this was too small. I may do an upgrade and then provide it uh, for the, well, like uh, material for the, the next module. I will sneak in and give you the up, up, <laughs> upgraded version. So I hope that you can see here, I increased the, the transit time, leaving everything unchanged. What do you expect to happen? I'm asking a question. Uh, Stefan, if you can see if anyone is answering, this would be interesting. Sure. So I'm asking the question, then I might give the answer and see if someone is, uh, is concurring with me. So if I increase the time in the external circuit, so if I'm changing the design of the core such that it takes more time for the liquid to go back in, the main impact will be on the boundary condition for the precursors. Therefore, I will have still a, a redistribution, but the boundary condition on the left, so in the end, in our case, is in on the left would be the bottom of the core, is modified. Why? Because it has been a stronger decay of the precursors before re-entering. So the shape, you may say it's more or less the same, but it is smaller because it's, there is a, a smaller feed from the bottom of the core, okay? And in the same way, if we reduce the, the transit time and therefore we, play, we as if we were able to have a very short circuit, of course, with this code, I can play numbers as I want. In reality, it's not so. There are so many other constraints, but here we are trying just to show the principles. If we reduce the transit time, of course, these two values at the uh, at the bottom of the core and at the top of the core will become closer and closer to the limit of almost being equal if that number is set to zero. Okay, so this is a parameter that, of course, is related to the characteristics of the circuit. I'm just replugging the number that was originally that impacts on the neutronics. So the geometry also, and therefore the time it takes for the, the flow, the velocity, and therefore the time it takes for the fuel to go through the whole circuit has an impact on the neutronics. Then we were talking about the, the decay, the, the family. So the, the, the decay constant, lambda 0 0.1. If you go and look for the six families or eight families of delayed neutron precursors, there are values of the decay constant that go from 0 0.01 to one and something to whatever. 
The point is uh, you can, we can then change the value, for instance, plug a lambda that, that is 0 0.01. What does this mean? It means that uh, since lambda is, has become small, the decay time has become bigger because it is the inverse. Therefore, this effect is even stronger, the fact that the neutrons are emitted in a different location with respect to the, to the fission event. So if I'm just changing that, leaving everything unchanged, I'm always scared that something might go wrong because I don't trust myself. Sto facendo qualcosa? Ah. Okay, no, no, it is correct. Well, let me just do this. This is this, the initial case that we studied. Let me there. Okay, this is the initial case that we studied. I'm sorry, that probably is not very visible. I really encourage you to try yourself since, uh, as I just realized, I was not very effective in this. If you reduce uh, the decay constant and therefore the lifetime is bigger, you will see even a, a bigger redistribution and it's the, the, the effect is really subtle. Probably if you do it with the, with the program that you have in your computer, you will see it. Here, the distribution is almost constant. Because by the time they go around the circuit, no one has decayed because they have this decay time that is so long. Result, the precursors are completely redistributed in a uniform distribution. Let's go to the other uh, limit. So we take a larger decay constant, smaller decay time. You see, again, a different result. Why do I have a, a shape like this? I still have a, dis the, how do I say, a displacement with respect to the fission distribution that would be the flux. But it is less relevant. You see the, the, the curve is not as uh, shifted as we had previously. And on the other side, the effect of the boundary condition is much bigger because since these uh, precursors have a mean lifetime of one second, Basically, they spend 2.8 mean lifetime outside of the core. So there are a lot of them that will decay and emit a neutron outside. All of this uh, results in a different reactivity loss and a different beta loss. I wasn't commenting on that because, because I was looking at the graph, so I was, uh, uh, it was my fault. So if you play around with the reasonable numbers, let's say, you will see that uh, you will experience the effect of the decay constant. It, remember, all of them are present. Here you can choose uh, one or the other, but we need to remember that in reality, we have different families with different decay constants because and all of them will concur with a different effect to the global effect on the reactivity and beta effective loss. So these are just to show you separately the effect on each family in some, in some sense. Of course, you can also play with the velocity. I'm just doing this and then I might open for question. If I reduce the velocity, you see I'm taking the, the cursor here and I'm putting it very close to zero to the minimum velocity that is five centimeters per second. Of course, if the velocity becomes very small, the transit time in the external circuit will become very big. I'm just uh, uh, playing around again a little bit. So I am increasing the transit time, let's say uh, 20 seconds to be consistent with the fact that I reduce the velocity. If I do that, what do you see? The fuel is almost still. As a result, their activity loss is very limited. And if and this is very visible, if you look at the, the gauge of their activity loss here in the uh, bottom left, the change in the precursor distribution is very limited itself. Also because lambda this time was equal to one. So you have also, if you want to do comparison that are significant, and this is something that every professor is saying to every student, you change one parameter at a time. You don't change two parameters together. Otherwise you don't understand who is responsible for what. So if you go to the initial case and you reduce the velocity, you see that still you have a macroscopic effect that has still a not negligible effect on their activity. So you have to try to, if you want, I mean, want to play around with this small, simple code, you are able to appreciate the effect of the velocity and therefore the transit time, the two things need to go together. 
the family that you are looking at or also the value of the of the um, of the value of beta that as we commented may depend on the specific fuel that you are using if you notice here i just plugged a few numbers again i'm not saying that this is the number corresponding to that specific fuel composition are just numbers representative of different configurations that you may have i would rather prefer to chat but if you uh, will have a look on my screen so first of all there are some files which you can unzip once you download it and there is a matlab script which is more or less kind of post-processing script and there are uh, who how many 10 files there are 10 files which represents kind of output of msr simulation with uh, equal 0d version 2 routine this is a little bit outdated routine we used roughly like eight eight years ago seven years ago but the beauty is that the output file uh, can be used for uh, creating nice plots so uh, if i start the routine okay the font is very small as it was in the previous case uh, generally what you can select there as an input file is is the your input file so you I have here one uncommented input file, which is now the source. I can change it to another one. It's prepared so that it's very easy to modify. Uh, only other parameter you can modify is, for instance, the threshold for printing, so that only nuclides with certain mass or only nuclides with certain rate are printed. And if you uh, click Run, then after a while you get a plot. And I have here one plot already a little bit zoomed in. And I would like to explain you what you what you see, so that you can then yourself actually go through these files and uh, uh, analyze it a little bit. So it's typically close to uranium, uh, plutonium, or thorium uranium cycles. So you have 100% feed of thorium or uranium. So in this case, in this case, there is 100% feed of thorium too. So and this gives you roughly say the rate so the rate of uh, refilling is 100 percent the neutron induced uh, rates or all rates in the plot are normalized to fission which is normalized to 100 percent so if you look on uranium-3 as the major fissile element below you see red square which means fission and 85 percent so 85 percent in this case takes place on uranium-3 then you see, for instance, N gamma reactions. So there is 12 or 13 percent chance that uranium 3 will not be fission and uh, will be transmuted to uranium 4. It should be an equilibrium fuel composition. It is not. In some cases, it is not. So op, uh, in optimal case, uh, if you have a reaction rate for creation, so for instance, for uranium 3, there is 97.3 percent reaction rate for creation through protactinium decay it should be in balance with the other reaction so we have 85 percent fission and 12 and half or 13 uh, percent and and gamma so if you sum these two it should equal to the creation rate yes not all the compositions are at equilibrium at perfect equilibrium uh, but uh, at least they are near to it so this example which i just show is the msfr reactor so what you can see is actually the for instance the chance that protactinium 3 will capture a neutron is slightly less than one percent so you lose one percent of your neutrons you can say or uh, of your reaction rates compared to fission uh, at this capture yes so uh, and 12% go to uranium-4 and then you can also have a look on the mass so the number here is mass in percent so there is thorium mass which is roughly 80% uranium mass is roughly 10% and uranium-3 and uranium-4 mass is around 5% so half of uranium-3 but once you create uranium-4 it's not fissile the capture rate is almost the same like before you create uranium-5 which is fissile again 8% 
Uh, interestingly, if this fission fails, you have 3% capture rate to create uranium-6, and then it kind of propagates up to up to plutonium-8. So you have still 2.5% rate here, 2.5% rate here. Plutonium-8 is a little bit fissile, so 1%, and then it goes further with 1%. Now, I will close this example and take one, uh, which is probably a little bit out of equilibrium, but which is completely different. So let me take, for instance, the case of pebble bed reactor. So salt-cooled pebble bed reactor in a uranium-plutonium cycle. So thermal reactor, very thermal reactor. And uh, in uranium-plutonium cycle. So definitely this reactor cannot work. We know that. And we may have a look on this plot why it is not so. Yes. So again, uranium-8 is on the only material which you refill. 95% of actinides is uranium-8. Plutonium-9 concentration is only 0.25. It's one quarter of percent. Before we had 10% in the fast system. In this thermal system, we have only 0.25 of a percent. Not even half percent. So it's a ridiculously low mass. And such a system will be terribly sensitive for fission products. Yes, but okay, in this study we exclude fish products. But let's have a look what happens, yes. Only 63 or 62% of fissions happens on plutonium-9. Almost 40%, 37% of the interactions fails and create plutonium-40, which is not fissile. And here you see it's not in equilibrium because you have 37% creation. And it, okay, no, it, it, is maybe, it may be in equilibrium because there is a decay rate of 3% here. So together it makes roughly 40. So then you create 41, plutonium-41, which is fissile. Yes, a lot, but still big chance to fail. And because of that, if you go further, you end up by curium-245. So 7% of your fission in such a reactor take place on curium-245. So Sandra discussed a little bit the concept of ETA, but uh, what is this concept a little bit hiding is that if you go to thermal spectrum, finally, uh, up to 10% of your fissions uh, will take place on very higher minor actinides, so on curium, for instance. But uh, what is the problem with that? The problem with that is that curium-5 was created from plutonium-9, and you needed one, two, three, four, five, six neutrons. So, so to say, if plutonium-9 fission fails, you can waste up to six neutrons and create curium-45, which is then later fission. Yes. And this is the overall economy of the equilibrium vector, which is already critical. You can forget structural materials, you can figure out fission products. Already the equilibrium vector of actinides is subcritical. Okay, maybe if you remove americium and curium from the system, maybe you improve the situation a little bit. But still, you will end up uh, being subcritical. So what, what you can do, actually, you can check all these files. Yes, uh, let, let me show, for instance, uh, uranium plutonium cycle in uh, uh, chloride fast reactor. So let me show something with very hard, if not the hardest spectra. And uh, okay, I will zoom again a little bit to the area. Now, since it is fast reactor, the chance for fission is much higher. So let's have a look now. Uranium-8 concentration is only 82%. It was 95 before. Plutonium-9 concentration is 10%. So you have uh, 40 times more fissile material in this reactor than in the thermal breeder, breeder. Yes. And it's not a miracle that fast reactors are more flexible from a uh, fission products perspective. It's not about cross-section. It's about the ratio of fission products and fissile materials. So if you have 10% of uh, fissile materials, you can easily afford 10% of fission products in the system. One to one, it's fair. In the previous case, you had only 0.25% of fissile material. So already at the burn up of 0.25, you may face difficulties. 
Now, if you go further, the chance of uh, plutonium fission is around 70%. Yes. So this is what I presented. The plutonium-9 fission chance is below 75. Even with such a hard spectrum, it's 70, 71%. Yes. Uh, now, uh, plutonium-40 is not fissile in thermal spectrum, but in a fast reactor, it is fissile. You have 18% creation rate and only 10% is continuing. So you have 7% fission rate of plutonium-40. Plutonium-41, of course, is fissile. So not much is going uh, behind plutonium-41. Yes, together it's like, uh, I don't know, 3.3%. 3 so in this case, curium-45 is 0.3%. Yes, it's a factor of 20 compared to thermal system. So now if I look on such a chart myself, usually the first thing I do, I looked on the uh, concentration of major fissile. So I see 10% of fissile. It means I'm in a fast reactor. And then I look on the ratio between uh, major fissile and the next fertile. So typically, if it is 50% of the fissile, I can say, okay, yes, the neutron economy is quite good. Now let me change the plot. And let's have a look on heterogeneous fast uh, salt, uh, uh, chloride system in the same cycle. You add lead to the system, you add certain scattering inside, you have also structural materials, so you soften the spectra. Now, if I zoom again, uh, the picture is very similar, 10% of plutonium-9, but instead of 5% of plutonium-40, you have already almost 8% of plutonium-40. Because of the scattering cross-section presence, because of flat and structural materials, the chance of fast fission was strongly decreased for plutonium-40. Also for plutonium-8, I didn't mention it. If you go backwards, do it at home, you will see that in the homogeneous chloride fast reactor, it was almost 12% here for direct fission of uranium-8. Here it is only eight because of the scattering cross-section. So you deteriorate uh, the fuel cycle easily with adding scattering cross-section. I have such a results also for lead cooled fast reactor, sodium cooled fast reactor. I can provide them if somebody is interested. Uh, of course, it all works because uh, we have a lot of neutrons in the uranium plutonium cycle to waste. But uh, once again, let's say chloride, homogeneous chloride fast reactor and MSR has very hard spectrum and Close to it, comparable is uh, SFR with metallic fuel, which very high, very high fuel density, which makes it uh, uh, less sensitive to scattering cross section of steel and uh, sodium. So I don't know what else to say uh, for it. You can go through. There is a legend, so you can uh, yourself look on the legend and try to understand the charts and analyze different system systems. Now maybe I will I will uh, show as the last one homogeneous chloride system with thorium fuel, and you will see there that the fission chance for direct fission chance for thorium, even though you have extremely hard spectrum, is not so breathtaking as it was for uranium eight. Yes. So uh, wait, I need to move it a little bit. So now. Thorium is the feeded material, is the feed, and the fission chance is 2.5. Yes. Uranium 3 mass around 9, uranium 4 mass roughly the half. After uranium 5, there is only 1.3% neutrons going further, so neutron economy is good. For thorium cycle, we can say even excellent. For tactinium capture, 1%. Okay. Okay. So let me before I end up, address two things. Protactinium capture 1% and fission rate of thorium 2.5%. 2, 2, 2 I will look again on uh, the initial system on homogeneous fluoride fast reactor in thorium cycle because this is our working horse. Okay, the plot is always on another screen, so I need to move it first. So what we see here, since the spectrum is much softer, it's only one and a half percent chance of fission, but the productinium capture rate is the same, roughly the same. Yes. Uh, 
let's have a look for graphite moderated MSR in thorium cycle. What is the protactinium capture chance? Just for curiosity, why maybe to explain why they need to separate it to breed. So in this case, it is two and a half percent. So a factor of two and a half, yes, higher. So, so uh, if you separate protactinium and let it decay outside of the neutron flux, you can save two and a half neutrons for it per each fission. It's uh, per hundred fission, sorry. So it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. At the same time, the uh, uranium-3 and uranium-4 masses are again uh, two to one. So uranium-4 mass is half. Okay, in this case is rather 70%. But the, the chance that uranium-5 fission will fail, 2.2, is higher than in fast spectrum. Okay, before I really end up, let me show again uranium-plutonium cycle in the uh, homogeneous chloride fast reactor. So that you will see that I was not kidding about the direct fission of uranium-8. You cannot uh, maintain chain reaction with uranium-8 only, but you see it's 11%, yes. So 11% of all fissions take place directly on uranium. So if you fission uranium-8 directly, it costs you one neutron. If you fission plutonium-9, it costs you two neutrons. You need to transmute uranium and then fission plutonium. If you fission plutonium-41, it costs you four neutrons, yes, and so on and so on. So uh, if you are interested, I wrote several papers uh, dedicated to self-sustaining breeding. So if you Google self-sustaining breeding or check my presentation for the links, you can have a look how you can use uh, the beauty of equilibrium composition to enumerate uh, neutronic performance of such a irradiation chain. So you have now the input files, you have the plotter, what you can do also, you can uh, change the threshold if you want to see less or more. So if I strongly increase the threshold, yes, I will probably not see much in this case. Yes, it's not really much what is ongoing if I strongly reduce the threshold in this rig. Okay, that's all from my side. So I don't know if there are some questions. Uh, and if maybe Stefano can uh, uh, read them for me. Yeah, for the moment there is no uh, questions. Mm -hmm. So if this is still the case, I think uh, they have to, to play a little bit with your uh, with your map.